service. Praise the Lord. Thank you for coming to the house of the Lord. It's not so cold. <laughs> Only 12 degrees. We haven't been to less than 10 degrees here in the first place. So, yes. 10, 11, 12, 13. We can go with 5. Or two. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. We are here. Amen. And uh, we are going to talk about the law of liberty. The law of freedom. If the Son of Man has set you free, you are free indeed. And the freedom is absolute freedom. You can do anything you want. Not just to go against God. You can worship God as long as you can. You will have peace as long as you want it. Love as long as you want it. Things pertaining to God you can do with liberty and freedom. But to sin is not. The only thing then you can do is not to displease God, but to please God. He's the one that gives you liberty not to sin. And praise the Lord. The book of Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 to 14 says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. When we are born again, He set us free. He set us free from the dangers of false doctrines. He set us free from the doctrines that will um, send us to hell. Doctrines that is false. He set us free from tradition. He set us free from so many things. Vices, um, habits, and things that the Lord wants to get rid of our lives, He set us free. Mm -hmm. But then, He's not only setting us free, we have to do it ourselves. So God and I, or you, will do it together. We're co-laborers with God. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So the word love there fulfills all the law. The love. So we have been set at liberty, but then it's predicated on the word love. You will not lie if you love your brother. You will not be selfish if you love your brother. So, uh, we are so blessed that God has given us this law of freedom, the law of liberty. At the close of an important speech of Congress in January 6, 1941, still old, not been born yet, <laughs> but this is one of the principles that has been written down in history and been carried out until now. President. Franklin D. Roosevelt shared his vision of the kind of world he wanted to see after the war was over. He envisioned four basic freedoms enjoyed by all people. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom of from want, and freedom from fear. That's what he envisioned for all the people that he's trying to govern that is in America. And for sure, he wants, he wants this to be all over the world. For some degree, these freedoms have been achieved on a wider scale in 1941 onwards. And a lot of people, a lot of nations have uh, assumed this freedom. But a world still needs another freedom. 
I call it the fifth freedom. So I've been saying to you four freedoms that Franklin D. Roosevelt was trying to implement, but we need still another freedom, the fifth freedom. Man needs to be free from himself and the tyranny of his sinful nature. That's the fifth freedom. We need to be free from ourselves. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's amazing, isn't it? We need to be free from ourselves, even from a young age. It's like Elisha. <laughs> Elisha and Reuben and Joseph and Regina. All the young kids and Amelia and Rihanna. They have already developed some kind of habit. And we need to be free from that. Because if that habits continue, that's the flesh. The battle for freedom was the central matter in the life of St. Paul. With fervency white hot in nature, Paul addresses the subject of Christian liberty. In his letter to the Galatians, we have read Galatians 5. To him, Christianity was essentially free, emancipated, free from slavery, a new person. And Jesus Christ was the first of all, the great emancipator. He set us free. We've been bondage in sin and under the dominion of the devil. So the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that set us free. The great emancipator. Okay, let's talk about the rights for liberty. The, sorry, the fights for liberty. The fights for liberty stand among the supreme struggles of the human race. And I've stated here some of the things that we've been set free. Sometimes they have, they have to do with political liberty, such that will not be subject to this politicism that the world is having. Political liberty and glow with the light of many a heroic charge and the patient courage of many a long campaign. There are some political issues depending on the government, form government the nation has. One has tyranny, one has democratic, one has communistic, and so many, so on and so forth. We've been set free from those things. Sometimes they have to do with moral and spiritual freedom. And tell the tale of the lonely human spirit struggling with the supreme matters of destiny. So he's free to choose his destiny. He's not obliged anymore to do these things regarding people oppressing you to do these immoral things and and spiritual. So you've been set free. Sometimes they have to do with freedom of the mind and lead us to great laborious where in bloodless conflict. Daring scholars and thinkers with the rise of the uncoerced intellect. You have the mind to think, the mind to study, the mind to express. In all these fields, we read the tale with the glowing enthusiasm, and as we read, we come to feel more and more the majesty of freedom. The majesty of freedom. Amazing that we've been set free. The Englishman, the English statesman and humanitarian named William Wilberforce, was born in 7, 1759. Died 1833, was a prominent abolitionist or anti slavery leader. He wants to abolish slavery. In 1788 and 1789, he worked diligently to have a new law passed in the House of Commons to abolish the practice of slavery. He failed to get it passed. William Wilberforce 
would introduce the bill every year through 1790s, uh, 1790s. Every year he passed the bill. On February 23, 1807, Parliament voted overwhelmingly, well, overwhelmingly in favor of abolition of the slave trade. Wow. During the debate, Sir Samuel Romilly spoke against slavery. His speech concluded with the long and emotional tribute to Wilberforce, Wilberforce in which he contrasted the peaceful happiness of Wilberforce in his bed with the tortured sleeplessness of the guilt Napoleon Bonaparte, of the guilty Napoleon Bonaparte, sorry. Wilberforce was overcome by the power of Romulus concluding passages and sat with his head on his hands, tears streaming down his face. As Romilly reached his final sentences, the house broke into one of those scenes that is reserved for great occasions. Members stood and cheered him tumultuously. Romilly's biographer would later write of the glorious night that the bill passed. On July 23, 1833, the Emancipation Bill received its final commons reading. And thank God, William Wilberforce said, that I have lived to witness a day in which England is willing to give 20 million sterling for the abolition of slavery. Wow. He lived to see the Emancipation of Slavery. Slaves. Three days, three days later, on July 29, 1833, William Wilberforce died. Amazing. After the bill was passed, three days after, he died. The men who make way for freedom do not always receive such public recognition, but they serve one of the supreme causes in all the world. In Galatians 5.13 we have read, you were called to freedom or to liberty. And indeed, his whole career was succession of campaigns for the moral and spiritual liberation of the human spirit. Paul had written a lot of scriptures especially in the New Testament. The achievement of liberty, however, is not the end, but only the very beginning of a far journey. That's right. When you're born again, you've been set free, that's just the beginning. Amen. There's still a lot more roads to travel, oh, yes. things to conquer. Right. So Christian liberty, what is Christian liberty? To be certain, biblical Christianity is not a life of bondage. No way. But one of liberty. We've been set free. We are not in bondage anymore. Church is not bondage. Amen. Going to Wednesday night service is not bondage. It's a privilege that God has given us. Oh, yes. Make Amen. use of it. We go to church because it's good. Gain more knowledge and understanding. It's not bondage. That's right. So this liberty does not, however, eliminate the call to holiness. When you are born again, it's not only that you've been set free from sin and hell and the, uh, uh, the guilt, but also you're entering into a realm that God wants us to be holy. There are three aspects of Christian liberty. First, the freedom not to sin. I told you before, our freedom is absolute, but that freedom is absolutely true 
because we are not going to commit sin. We are the children of God and our freedom belongs to God to do the things that God wants us to do. The freedom not to sin. This automatically means submission to God's will since the two, the two are mutually exclusive. Your will and our will. Sin nature and God's nature. Mutually exclusive. They could not mix together. They could not be partners. They could not become husbands and wives. They could not be friends. Mutually exclusive. To exercise Christian liberty means to break free from sin's bondage. Which means to obey and serve God alone. No other gods. No other idols. No other things in between you and God. Which in turn means to serve righteousness and holiness. To serve righteousness. You have to develop righteousness that God has imputed in us. <laughs> he imputed us the righteousness that we could not attain. Human righteousness is way, way down below. Because human righteousness is a spirit that runs in the eyes of God. We cannot make ourselves righteous, even if how much good we are. Cornelius is an epitome of a righteous and good man. And yet he needs salvation. He needs the righteousness of God. And holiness. Without which no man shall see the Lord. And to bear fruit unto holiness. Romans 6, 15 to 23. You will put that in your nose and take a look at it. Fruits, fruit unto holiness. Second, three aspects. <coughs> Christian liberty is freedom from the law. Freedom from the law. When you are born again, when you possess the love of God in your hearts, you are above the law. That's why we will not accuse a brother and, and drug him to the court of this world. Because our law is above the law of the land. God's laws. So, God has not abolished moral law, for sure. He has not abolished moral law. We still don't kill people. <laughs> we still don't want to commit our neighbor's, neighbor's wife. We will not steal. And all the ten moral laws that God has given Moses, they pick up all even today. It's a moral law. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. Still pick up today. Third commandment. But Christians are free from the Old Testament law in several ways. We no longer subject ourselves to the law of the um, Jewish nation is trying to observe. <coughs> We are free from the penalty of the law, which is death. For a wages of sin is death, according to the law. If you receive your wages when you work with somebody, after a week you receive your wages because you work. But if you have sinned, 
you will receive the wages of death. So the law says the wages of sin is death. And we have been set free from that. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ was, was a substitution for our own punishment. Therefore the law has no power to condemn you and me. Because the Lord Jesus Christ said, let me replace you instead of you to be put to death is my life. Let me be put to death instead of you. Wow. <clears throat> so can the devil condemn us? Because the Lord Jesus Christ said, no, don't condemn me. Condemn me. Put me to death. Oh, oh. That's why it's the scripture that says there is now no condemnation. Then the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We are free from the attempt to fulfill the law by human effort alone. So the law that was given by Moses, by God to Moses, is more on physical things. The nature of human. We are free from the destru destructive power of the law caused by man's abuse of the said law. The law of man is subject to abuse and misuse. They can devise some kind of thing that will cater to their own interest. So we're being set free from that. Because the law of love is something. By that we mean the law which was good in itself. The law was good because it magnifies sin. There you will realize that you are a sinner because of the law. Without the law, there is no, nothing to condemn us when we sin. So the law is good and righteous. A court actually became a harmful force because men erroneously relied on it for justification and thereby rejected faith in Christ. Because of the law, they rejected faith in Christ. You have the law. It's so Romans 9, 31, up to 10, 3. <clears throat> you have that? We don't have that there. Uh, I'll look Let's take up. a look at Romans chapter 9. Verse 31. For as he is right through ever in pursuit of the law for the securing of righteousness, right standing with God, actually did not succeed in fulfilling the law. They were not able to fulfill the law in themselves. It's a yoke on their neck that they could not carry. For what reason? Because they pursued it not through faith, relying instead on the merit of their works. They did not depend on faith, but on what they could do. That's what is the disadvantage of the law. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion si a stone which makes men stumble, a rock that will make them fall. But he who believes in him, who adheres to, trusts in, and relies on him, shall not be put to shame, nor be disappointed in his expectations. When you expect something from the Lord Jesus Christ, when you believe on him, we can have that expectation according to his will. And his word. So Romans 10, 1, or Romans 10 and 3, uh, verses 1 to 3, it says, Brethren, with all my heart's desire and goodwill for Israel, I long and pray to God that they may be saved. Paul wants to save the, issue, the nation of Israel. I bear them witness that they have a certain zeal and enthusiasm for God, but it is not enlightened and according to 
that the great and vital knowledge for being ignored of the righteousness that's, that God ascribes, which makes one acceptable to Him in the world, thought and deed, and seeking to establish a righteousness and means of salvation of their own, they did not obey or submit themselves to God's righteousness. That's why they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ was trying to gather them as a hen under His wings, but they would not. They rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. We are free from the ceremonial law. We will not carry any more a bullock or a goat or a lamb when we commit sin. Because the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is more than enough to forgive our sins. We are free from a non-moral mothers. By that we mean that Christians can participate in an activity that does not violate biblical teachings. Everything will be in line with the Word of God. We have the liberty of individual judgment. Meaning that we have the freedom to follow our own conscience in morally neutral areas such as eating of meat and observance of certain days. Let's, let's, if you read Romans chapter 14 that talks about meat offered to idols, meat eating meat in certain days, judging people whether they eat vegetables or not, uh, whether they will observe certain certain day, you cannot judge a person because he's free to judge and to choose <clears throat> according to the word of God. So you will read it in, in Romans chapter 14 about those who are weak in the faith, those who are weak in standing with God, they eat vegetables. <laughs> really? They don't eat meat. That's the vegetarians. But we eat meat. We have eat vegetables and, and uh, uh, some foods uh, for 21 days because we want to dedicate that for the Lord, the things that we desire. But we are not vegetarians. We eat vegetables and we eat meat. So you can, they cannot judge us by eating meat. During Good Friday, we eat pork. And, and, and beef and sausages but other groups will condemn you if you eat meat on that day on that season of Lent they call it they could not condemn us because we've been set free from that yeah. Romans chapter 14 rather than judging others in these personal areas we are to be true to our own convictions we've been set free Food offered to idols should not be eaten according to the word. Even tradition tells us. When we were Catholic, during All Souls Day and All Saints Day, they offered some food in the altar so that the dead souls can come back and eat the food. And we are not supposed to eat that because that's for the dead that comes back. <laughs> Ooh, such a tradition. Mm. When we were young, <laughs> we go to the altar, but there's nobody watching. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've been set, set free from that kind of, of tradition. Romans 7 14, if you read it. But, has a bad day. You are not going to partake of this food over to idols. If your brother or sister that is weak in the faith will stumble and fall and backslid because of what you've done. Although your freedom is absolute yet, it's not all experience. 
You have to say, oh, well, I will not eat it because my brother or sister, if he knows or if she knows, she will say, we are not going to eat food over to idols. Oh, she stumbles, she falls, but sleep. So Paul said, I'd rather not eat them. Just for the sake of a weak brother or sister. And Paul said, idols are nothing anyway. I can eat any food. I can just give thanks and glory to God for the food on the table and I eat it. We eat bugs and, and, and rats and dogs and... <laughs> That's it really matter. People hate it, but any food offered on the table, we eat it. <laughs> Hallelujah, but there. Well, anyhow. <laughs> Finally, Christian liberty does not negate the responsibility to obey scriptural teachings. We must obey biblical scriptural teachings. Romans 6.15 Romans 6.15, let's go there. And see. Let's say about it. What then are we to conclude... Shall we sin because we, we live not under the law but under God's favor and mercy? Certainly not. Certainly not. And then Galatians 5.13 that read, we have been called to freedom. Nor does it eliminate the responsibility to follow godly leaders when they apply biblical principles of holiness to contemporary issues. So when a pastor or a leader says something like this in the church, we are going to do this because it's according to the principles of holiness in the church and the Bible, then we ought to follow godly admonitions and guidance. Acts 15, 28 to 29. Let's take a look at those scriptures. Acts 15, 28 to 29. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit that to us not to lay upon you any greater burden than these indispensable requirements. So these are the requirements for the Gentiles that came to the church, that they were saved, that they are born again. In verse 29, as they lay down the verdict, that you abstain from what has been sac sacrificed to idols. No more food offered to idols. That's why. Some people cannot eat it because of this. From tasting and from tasting or eating blood and from eating the meat of animals that has been strangled. So we could not eat food offered to idols, refrain from idolatry. And then he said, do not eat blood. And then he said, animals, meat of animals that have been strangled. So you cannot eat a chicken that has been and the blood is not come out. The blood should come out. Spill to the ground. So if somebody sold you some chicken that the yet is being strangled on by it. Or some birds. Then he says, from sexual impurity, from fornication. Adultery. We must not do it. If you keep yourselves from these things, you will do well. <laughs> Fair you will. Be strong. So those are the things that the Black Bible has told us Gentiles not to do these four basic uh, requirements. 
Hebrews 13, 17. Let's go there. Hebrews 13, 17. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your spiritual leaders and submit to them, continually recognizing their authority over you, for they are constantly keeping watch over your souls and guarding your spiritual welfare as men who will have to render an account of their trust. So spiritual leaders, pastors, give an account of what has been given to them by the master. With the Lord Jesus Christ. They watch over your souls. That's why it's not only my own personal opinion and thing that I do in the church. I pray and ask God. So I said, well, if I'm wrong, leave it to God. He's going to judge me. Don't point a finger. For your soul, spiritual welfare, do your part to let them do this with gladness and not with sighing and groaning. So your your spiritual leaders, when they do it, don't just ah. Again, <laughs> you're teaching us that lesson again. Eh, don't do that. But said, let them do this and with gladness. Yeah. One thing we need that. Not with sign and groaning, for that would not be profitable to you. Wow. <laughs> Acts 15, we have read it, Hebrews 13, you know, in the other version of that, in Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Be responsive to your pastoral leaders, listen to their counsel, they are alert to the condition of your lives and work under the strict supervision of God. That's why I said, God is the one that does everything. I am just an instrument for His goodness and righteousness. We are in the church of the living God. We are serving a God that is always with us, through us, and all over us. And he is a living God. You cannot just do the things you want to do because He looks and hears, sees everything, knows everything that you do. Wow! If the God that you serve knows everything that you do, be very careful of what you do. Contribute to the joy of their leadership, not its drudgery. We have this liberty, brothers and sisters. We have this freedom given to us by God. Why would you want to make things harder for them? That's what the other translation means. It's not profitable to you. The Bible gives four guidelines for the proper exercise of Christian liberty in non-moral matters. The Christian should do all to God's glory. 1 Corinthians 10.31 Let's take a look at it. 1 Corinthians 10.31 So then, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you may do, do all for the honor and God's glory. Whatever you do, in word or in deed. Okay. Okay. Eat, whatever you do. To all to the glory of God. Okay. To all to God's glory. Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Colossians 
problems. The Christian should avoid anything not beneficial. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. Everything is permissible, allowable, and lawful, expedient for me. But not all things are helpful, good for me to do, expedient, and profitable when considered with other things. Everything is law lawful for me, but I will not become the slave of anything or be brought under its power. Mm -hmm. Although this absolute freedom and liberty that I have with God, I can do anything. I can drink wine and liquor and alcohol and beer. I can do it. I can gamble. I can do this. But you will be under the power of God. That's true. And that's the power of the devil. So, portion, everything is local. Experience. I can do it. But I will not be brought to the power of any of these things. So it will cause you addiction. The power of the enemy will be on you. Why should you do it? Mm. This is one of the principles in the Bible. Not all of the things are written in the Bible for our admonition. But the principles written. It's not beneficial. <coughs> and 1 Corinthians 10.23 All things are legitimate, permissible, and we are free to do anything we please. I'm reading on the Amplified Version. But not all things are helpful, expedient, profitable, and wholesome. All things are legitimate, but not all things are constructive to character. All things are legitimate, but not all things are constructive to character and in defying to spiritual life. Not all things. Only the things that God prescribed us to do. That's what we, we are set at liberty. The real freedom that God has given us is we know the bad things that will harm us. That's the real freedom. We know the things that are not beneficial. We know the things that are evil. We know the things that will harm us and our neighbors and our loved ones. So we don't do it. That's real freedom. It's God, God has given us that kind of freedom. Amen. And the world sees freedom as different thing. I can do everything I want to do. That's what their freedom is. Become wild. They do it just according to their sinful heart because the heart is deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked. Who can know the heart? So they just do whatever the heart says. And that's not freedom at all. That's wild. Like an animal. Christians should abstain from things detrimental to him physically, mentally, or spiritually. He should lay aside every weight that so easily beset you. Hindrances, sins, as well as an outright sin, recorded in the book of Hebrews 12 and 1. Lay aside every weight so easily beset us. Third, the Christian should avoid anything that will gain dominance in his life. If that thing will dominate you and, and you will be uh, easily tempted by that, don't do it. Whatever it is. He must not become addicted to anything. Yeah, maybe except for him. <laughs> or praise or worship or going to church. But he's talking about worldliness. Allowing it to rob him of too much energy, time, or money. Some people are workaholic. They work 40 hours a week. They work, 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 work. 
from work, they go home, work, 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 work. Wow. We don't go to church because of work, 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 work. Rubs your energy, your time with God and your family. Is that good? That beneficial. You, your life should be balanced. You have a time for your children, play with your kids. But the everyone has two boys here, man. <laughs> play with these two boys are really hard. I have one grandson, but Playing with him, can't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, stay away from anything that interferes with your relationship with God, your family, your church, your loved ones. If nothing interferes and robs your energy and time. And he said, well, I have to do something about this. I have to do something about this. Finally, you must avoid harming others, of course. <laughs> Romans 14, 13 to 21. What about, do not judge things, do not judge others. Let's take a look at Romans 14. Romans 14, verse 13. It's too long. <laughs> they let us no more criticize and blame and pass judgment on one another, but rather decide and endeavor never to put a stopping block or an obstacle or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know I am convinced, persuaded as one of the, in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is forbidden as essentially unclean, defiled, and unholy in itself. But nonetheless, it is unclean, defiled, and unholy to anyone who thinks it is unclean. If you think it is unclean for you, then it's unclean for you. <laughs> think if it's clean for you, then it's clean for you. You think just wearing socks for a week is good for you? Just do it. I will judge you for it. <laughs> and I don't criticize your brother. Don't judge him. No. No. <laughs> Hallelujah. But if your brother is being pained or his feelings hurt, or if he is being endured by what you eat, then you are no longer walking in love. Wow. Mm -hmm. You have ceased to be living and conducting yourselves by standard of love toward Him. Do not let what you eat hurt or cause the ruin of one of whom Christ died. What is stumbling block, my brother? Mm -hmm. Amazing, isn't it? All this in Romans 14. The principles written by Paul regarding relationships. After all, the kingdom of God is not a matter of getting the food and the drink one likes, but instead it is righteousness that state which makes the person acceptable to God and heart, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He who serves Christ in this way is acceptable and pleasing to God and is approved by men. So let us then definitely aim for and eagerly pursue what makes for harmony and for mutual upbuilding, edification and development of one another. Uh, Ang buhay ng Kristiyano ay masayang tunay. Hallelujah. The life of a Christian is very rewarding. That's what it is. That's why people say, man, you know, if you're in the Pentecostal church, very, very strict. Ah. Well, if that will help me to go to heaven, so be it. I don't want to be in a group, in a, in a denomination that's free. 
but you're not true, you're not um, sure whether you're going to heaven. But if I'm sure that I'm going to heaven because of the laws and principles that I put within my heart, accept it. And I'll be, I'll be following that. 1 Corinthians 8, 9 to 13. 1 Corinthians 8, 9 to 13. Well, if we cannot finish this, we will continue this next time. Only be careful that this power of choice, this permission and liberty to do as you please, which is yours, does not somehow become a hindrance cause of stumbling to the weak or unscrupulous giving or unscrupulous, unscrupulous, giving them an Im impulse to sin. For suppose someone sees you, a man having knowledge of God with an intelligent view of this subject, and reclining at table in idol's temple, might, be, might he not be encouraged and emboldened to violate his own conscience scruples or, or good things, if he is weak and uncertain, and it what to him is for the purpose of idol worship. So here Paul was trying to still trying to explain about meats offered to idols. Because remember, he's an apostle to the Gentiles. And Gentiles loves idols. As I've said before, they offer this food. So their idols and gods and goddesses. In the Philippines we offer it to our dead ones. <laughs> so still Paul is trying to teach us. Verse 11, And so by your enlightenment, your knowledge of spiritual things, this weak man is ruined, is lost and perishes, the brother for whom Christ the Messiah died. And when you sin against your brethren in this way, wounding and damaging the weak conscience, you sin against God. So be very careful, otherwise, what not to do the things that will put a stumbling block to your brother or sister. Just be very careful. So you could also read that up to 13 and then 1 Corinthians 10, 32 to 33. I'll leave it up to you. Stay away from things that could cause someone else to stumble. You go to uh, a, a pub. I'm just there for food. But the brother that is weak in the faith sees you walking in the pub. What is she doing there? Man! So he stumbles. His, his clear conscience, his pure conscience was, oh, his faith was disturbed. So you're causing somebody to stumble. You're not drinking at the pub, but you're just eating there because their meats are good. They're cheap. See to it that nobody sees you. See you go. <laughs> <laughs> like order takeaway. 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 <laughs> because, you know, because if you have been set free, oh, I don't care. Oh, brother, sister, it's all right. I'm doing one new way. <laughs> if you see, if you see him, just turn around. Oh, I, I would just smell him. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go in because you will stumble and fall. <laughs> so, as you can see, even liberty has its limits. When the Christ, when Christ sets you free, He sets you free from the bondage of sin, because that's sinful to make your brother. <coughs> Some seem to erroneously believe that this freedom means they no longer have to be responsible for their actions. But scripture teaches us too. Galatians 6 and 7. 
Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Yes. So we are responsible for what we are doing. We are accountable to God. People who is not accountable of what he's doing, man, he's just digging his own grave. Okay. Wow. We are now. Maybe we'll continue this next time. Walking in Christian liberty. This uh, listen about the law of liberty is so long. Because we have to really analyze everything according to the scriptures. The law of liberty. Walking in Christian liberty. Can you understand? We'll continue this next time.